Welcome back to the third and closing video in chapter 4 of Crystal Clear Electronics 2. We continue our exploration of the development environment. Earlier, during the building of the project, we saw the .IOC file that could be used for configuration. Now let's take a closer look at that. Let's create a new project to avoid changing the settings of the example project. Double clicking on the .IOC file will open the CubeMX perspective for the project, where you can do the basic configuration of the microcontroller and configure the peripherals. Sometimes, unfortunately, the perspective for a given file does not open automatically. In this case, you can open it manually by clicking on the appropriate button. Let's take a look at the main views, which you can find by clicking on the buttons in the blue section above. The first of the main views is Pinout and Configuration, which is used to perform pin assignment and configuration. The grey shape in the middle represents the microcontroller we are using. It also shows the type of the microcontroller, which is STM32F446ZE-T6 in our case. You can also find the microcontroller's package here, which is LQFP144. This abbreviation will be discussed in a later chapter. The many small rectangles at the side symbolize the pins. If you look at them, this is what the device looks like in real life in the top view. You can use the mouse to move it and the scroll wheel to zoom in and out. If you zoom in on the pins, you can see that they are also labeled. These labels distinguish them from each other, making them easier to refer to. The pins are grouped into ports and the letter in their name represents this. For example, in the case of the PA2 pin, the letter P stands for port, letter A is the port ID, and number 2 means it is the second pin on the port. By default, all the pins of the microcontroller are configured in the reset state. That is, they do not perform any function. Left click on the PA2 pin for an example. We can select the function of the pin from a drop down list. What the different options mean and what they are for will be explained in more detail in a later chapter. Click on an option in the drop down menu. For example, click on the GPIO underscore output option in the drop down menu. You can see that the selected function is assigned to the pin, which is marked in green in the figure. If you right click on the selected pin, you can use the enter user label option to give it a more descriptive name, which will make things much easier later on in the programming process. Let's rename the PA2 pin to LED1, just to give you an example. It is possible to choose a functionality for a pin that will result in a yellow indicator in CubeMX. For example, this happens when the UART4RX option is selected on pin PA1. In this case, there is no need to be scared. It just means that the peripheral to the pin hasn't been enabled and configured yet. Since we have now selected the UART signal, let's take a look at this configuration. It can be seen that the UART4 peripheral for the UART4 underscore RX signal located in the connectivity drop down menu is not enabled. When the mode is changed to asynchronous, the yellow pin turns green since the peripheral is enabled and the configuration settings for the peripheral are displayed. The specific configuration parameters of these will be discussed in chapter 10. What do we do if we want to use a UART communication peripheral, but the previously selected pins? PA0 and PA1 are already occupied and therefore cannot be used. The obvious solution to this is to look at all the pins and configure them where it is possible. For a microcontroller with 16 or 32 pins, this is quite doable, but for a microcontroller with 64 or 100, even 144 pins, it can be time consuming. The search can be speeded up by clicking, for example, on the UART4 underscore RX while clicking on and holding down the control key. CubeMX will then mark the pins in pale blue, which are alternatives for placement. In the case of UART4 underscore RX, this is the PC11 pin. If we want to move the signal here, all we have to do is drag the mouse there. Release the mouse button when the destination pin turns dark blue and the UART4 underscore RX is moved to the new alternative location. Another option is to type the function you are looking for in the search box at the bottom. You can also type pin names in this search box or even search for the user labels you have given. The names we have given will be found in the main.h file, of course after code generation. Let's configure an I2C peripheral this time. Open the connectivity tab and select the I2C1 peripheral. 
set it to i square c, and then you can see that the cube MX has placed the necessary signals on the BB6 and PB7 pins. It is of course still possible to choose an alternative placement, but this is just another way of assigning the signals to the pins. Once you have finished configuring, you should save your changes. The easiest way to do this is to press Ctrl S or use the small floppy disk icon in the icon menu bar. When saving, the code snippets for the new configuration will be generated for us by the development environment if we want it, thus helping us to program. If we look at the main.c file, we can see that there are a lot of green commented lines, which serve as a kind of label for the programmer. Take extra care when writing your code to only write in a place that falls between an opening and closing comment, otherwise the next time you generate it, cubemx will delete it. This means, in all cases, we have to write the code between the begin and end tag. For example, if you write something here, it will be lost. But if you write something between the opening and closing comment, it will be kept. In addition to generating the code for us, Cubamax also offers us the possibility to see ready-to-use code snippets. Open the Manage Software Packs option in the Software Packs drop-down menu. We should see this window. Scroll down to the tab corresponding to your microcontroller, STM32F4 in our case. Once clicked, you can read what the software package contains under the Details tab. There are lots of examples and helping functions in the package, for example the hell, that is hardware abstraction layer functions are included as well, this will be discussed in the upcoming chapter. Getting the right clock signal is essential for the microcontroller to work. There are several ways to do this, and you can choose from them in the configurator. However, before we start setting the clock signals, let's enable external oscillators as clock inputs. To do this, in the Pinout and Configuration tab, scroll down to the System Core section and open the RCC configuration. RCC stands for Reset and Clock Control. You need to know your hardware to choose the proper settings. In the case of Nucleo, the easiest way to get the information you need is to refer to the panel's user manual and schematic. For LSE, that is low speed external, set the crystal ceramic resonator option, as this option represents the external crystal based oscillator implemented on the card. The HSC clock signal is received by the nucleo panels from their built in ST link, so we need to select the bypass clock source options. Once set, these parameters will immediately appear on the corresponding pins. Be sure to check that the CubeMX has assigned the oscillator signals to the correct hardware pins. The easiest way to do this is to check the schematic of the development board. You can see that the assignment is made to the corresponding pins, which are the PH0, PH1 and the PC14, PC15. When making these adjustments, always make sure that you have configured the signals to where it is hardware prepared. Click on the clock configuration tab at the top. This tab allows you to set the clock settings for the microcontroller. On the left side are the available clock sources, and on the right side are the clock frequencies generated by them with their corresponding peripheral names. There can be external clock sources, they are the LSC and HSC set before, but there are also built-in clock sources, which are LSI and HSIRC. The frequency of the external sources can be adjusted by clicking on the number and then typing in the value. The frequency of the internal sources cannot be adjusted. The desired clock frequencies are generated by the microcontroller by performing various multiplications and divisions by hardware and software. The simplest way to generate the clock signal you want to use is to enter the required frequency in one of the blue boxes, which are shown in the figure, and then press enter and the development environment will calculate the required settings. Let's try one of these settings. For example, change the APB1 timer clock to 12 MHz. After pressing enter, you can see that by using a combination of different multiplier, divider and multiplexer circuits, you have created a completely different clock configuration from the previous one. There might be a situation where we want to calculate a value that the microcontroller's clock network cannot produce, in which case the software will show this in red. Before stepping back, reset to the old value and recalculate the values with the Cubemax, as changing the frequencies of the different clocks can lead to unexpected changes, so always use these settings with caution. 
In the Project Manager tab, you can make administrative changes, such as changing the name. Still in the Project Manager tab, use the side navigation buttons to go to the Code Generator sub-option. Here you will find the settings related to the automatic code generation, which is mentioned earlier. In the File Generation section, it is recommended to turn on a few options. The first option result is much more transparent code. If you enable it, the code generated for peripherals will be organized in separate files by the code generator. The second option backs up the code before rebuilding it. The third option is responsible for making sure that the code we write is not lost between two builds, while the last one is responsible for deleting files that are no longer used. Go to the Tools tab in the top blue row. Here, you will find the Simulation tool to see what will be the power consumption of your planned application. You can select a state to simulate by pressing the New Step button. So far, we have been talking about how to make it as easy as possible to build our software using the development environment. You might legitimately ask, for example, if you have the code ready for an LED blinker program, but how will it actually be uploaded to the development board? The tool for this task is ST Microelectronics' programmer for microcontrollers, hereafter referred to as ST-Link. It is in fact a device containing a microcontroller itself, whose task is to transfer the program from the computer to the program memory of the microcontroller of the target hardware. With Nucleos, we are so lucky to have the ST-Link built into the panel, so all we need to do is connect a single USB cable to the panel, which is used for power and programming. Let's look at the situation when using a custom panel. In order to program our panel, we need to connect the two devices. In case of a separate ST-Link, we need to connect a 20-pin ribbon cable between the ST-Link compatible interface of the microcontroller and the programmer, and the USB mini USB cable between the computer and the programmer. For a Nucleo, simply plug in the USB cable. A status LED on the device will indicate when the connection has been established. This can also be found on the ST-Link built into Nucleo. After a successful connection, the LED lights up red. Of course, this is not a one-feature tool either. It offers many additional possibilities, from debugging your program to viewing the memory contents of your device. Some of these functions are also available from the STM32QID development environment, but operations closely related to ST-Link are also available in a separate program. This used to be the ST-Link utility software, but has now been replaced by STM32 Cube Programmer. It can be used for several things, but we won't discuss these programs now. You can read about ST-Link utility in the written curriculum. Before programming the development board with your first code, make sure that your ST-Link is running the latest software. To do this, select ST-Link Upgrade from the Cube IDE Help menu. Press the Open in Update Mode button. If you get an error message at the bottom, unplug and then plug the USB connector back into the computer. Then, if the version of the device and the latest available version differ, you can upgrade by clicking on the Upgrade button. After a successful upgrade, you will see an Upgrade Successful message at the bottom of the window. Once this is done, you can upload the program to the development board. We will now use the completed example project, which implements a rudimentary flash. For our panel, we have connected only one LED to the PD7 pin. The example project is also available for the black development panel used in the written curriculum and the F446 Nucleo on the curriculum's website. If you are working with a different panel, you will not be able to upload this one. But don't worry. In the next chapter, we will show you how to port the curriculum's example projects to other devices. You can upload the program using the run button in the menu bar at the top. Successful communication is indicated by a red-green flashing status LED on the device. After the upload is complete, take a look at the development board and if everything is done correctly, you should have successfully loaded your first embedded application onto the development board and should see the LED blinking. In this chapter, we have learned about the most important components of the STM32 Cube IDE and how to use them. After listening to this chapter, you will be able to use the functions of the development environment on your own and maybe even start your own projects. 
Of course, this chapter only describes the basic functions of the development environment, but if you want to learn more about the STM32 Cube IDE, you can find more information on the ST website. You will find a link in the description to help you. We hope the information we provided was helpful. We look forward to seeing you in the future videos. See you. Bye.